thank you all for uh, coming in and joining in on this. Uh, I want to thank uh, Matt Wong and for putting this together and uh, Eugene Moy and Kevin Law for uh, backing them up technically on it. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Uh, it's wonderful that USA WKF is doing this. Um, it's a great way to uh, keep us all engaged during the uh, pandemic. Um, I need to start first of all uh, by making a bit of a disclaimer. And that is, um, uh, I'm not here to, <laughs> to, to diss anybody's practice or to uh, discourage any practice. I uh, encourage practices of, of all sorts, you know, whatever you wanna do in terms of your martial arts practice, that's your choice, whatever makes you happy. Uh, I am going to dispel some myths uh, in terms of Chinese weaponry. There's a lot of um, uh, misinformation, or I shouldn't really say misinformation, but it's 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 been passed down to us in such a way through variations in translation and interpretation and modernization uh, that things have shifted a lot from what the original um, might have been, what, what people actually used to fight with in terms of weapons. Um, now, it may feel like I'm coming after modern wushu a lot, but that's kind of because modern wushu is the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, if you will. It, uh, it, it's a sport. And so the weapons that we use in modern wushu um, are the, um, the farthest from what was actually used in combat. Uh, the, the goals of fighting with, with sword is totally different different than the goals of fighting for sport, obviously. And uh, most of the stuff that's done in, except in the Duilian, of course, but most of the weapon stuff done in modern Wushu is solitary forms. So it's a whole different trip on how you want to do your swords. Um, a parallel, a parallel um, uh, metaphor would be uh, modern fencing. Uh, if I were to compare modern fencing weapons to the weapons that people were using to duel, while they're quite different. I mean, modern fencing weapons are electrified for one thing, so that makes an extraordinary difference. Uh, so I will be picking on Wushu weapons, but I'll be picking on traditional weapons too, uh, because there's a lot of uh, misinformation on that in terms of what the real weapons were and what we're using uh, commonplace um, <clears throat> in, in common practice. Uh, it's a lot like the Bodhidharma myth in Shaolin um, for a long time. And if you were to look at any books or articles from say 30, even 20 years ago, uh, we would talk about how Shaolin was created by Bodhidharma and how he um, became this, uh, he was this Indian uh, 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 tr transmitter of Zen and now he creates Shaolin Kung Fu and Shaolin Kung Fu becomes all of Kung Fu. And well, now uh, we looked at it from a scholarly point of view, uh, we know that that's very unlikely. Um, at the same time, we know that that myth has some meaning, that there's an intention behind it. And so um, it, it has, it, it's worth preserving, but it's worth preserving in a sense that uh, for, for what the metaphor is, for what it symbolizes. Uh, same is true for modern day weapons. I mean, I'm not proposing that we totally renovate uh, the kind of weapons that we're practicing with today. Um, and, and go back to, you know, make weapons great again. Um, I'm really thinking more on terms of making sure that as we carry on this tradition of Chinese martial arts, we understand the roots of it more clearly and um, understand the, the changes that have been made in terms of weaponry today that we use versus what um, authentic weapons were like. Um, that way, when we go into a museum and we see some of these weapons and they look different, uh, we're not surprised. Uh, and I know, um, I mean, it's very easy to get defensive about what Yashrufu said. I mean, I do that. Everybody does that. You know, part of Chinese martial arts is to uh, is, is bound by Confucianism. And so we definitely want to honor our teachers. Um, at the same time, um, if you can't question what Yashrufu said, the best you can achieve is an echo. And we want to forward this uh, tradition into the future generations. Um, we all respect our shuffles. Um, but um, the higher calling is that um, we all respect the martial arts more. And to properly honor that, uh, we need to constantly strive for authenticity. So what does authenticity mean? 
Um, I'm going to read a little dictionary definition right now. Um, authenticity means not false or copied. It means genuine. It means real. Uh, it means having uh, an origin supported by unquestionable evidence. It's authenticated. It's verified. Um, many years ago, I had a discussion with uh, Professor Peter Lorge uh, from uh, Vanderbilt University. He wrote a fantastic book called Chinese Martial Arts, and it's something really worth engaging because he looks at martial arts uh, by the different dynasties and how it progresses and evolves. Um, it will definitely open your mind in terms of some of the, uh, the mythologies we have and how martial arts were created. Um, he had a very distinct definition for um, authenticity, and uh, it, it, it's he's an academician, he's a scholar. And so it's another disclaimer I have to make that I am speaking, um, I'm defaulting to kind of speak towards the general population. This is not an academic talk. This is not um, uh, technical. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna keep the terms as soft as possible. Um, and so don't call me out on that stuff later. <laughs> um, the Chinese martial arts uh, has the greatest arsenal of any martial arts culture in the world. Um, it's really what drew me into the martial arts. Uh, I remember when I uh, first started, uh, actually the second time when I came returned to the martial arts, um, uh, I was really fascinated by swords. And I walked into my my uh, uh, um Wuhan at the time. And it was that just fabulous wall of a weapon, of ancient weapons around his altar. And I was like, I want to learn that. That's really um, what fascinates me. And so uh, that was well over 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've been, I've been chipping at this, this weapon problem for a long time. And uh, there's actually a, a, a dearth of research for Chinese martial arts. Now, uh, weapon research is generally called uh, hoplology. And the, the term comes from hoplites, which were an ancient um, ancient Greek warrior, an armored warrior. Um, and I, I think it, the root of it is like hop, I should have made it out of that, hop, hop something, ha, it's, a, it's a mythical armored animal, like some sort of armadillo or something. But, but um, it's generally used for, to refer to the study of arms and armor nowadays. Although some people have widened the scope to be the cross-cultural study of martial arts in general. Uh, the term comes, well, it's usually attributed to uh, Richard F. Burton, um, who lived from 1821 to 1890. And let me tell you, if you want to read a great story about um, a true warrior scholar, um, you should look into Richard Burton. He spoke many languages, he traveled, he um, really opened up uh, the Orient. He wrote a fabulous book called Book of the Sword, which was supposed to be the first in uh, a series of many books, um, uh, but he only, he only completed the first and it doesn't really address Chinese martial arts at all. Um, there are few works on Chinese martial arts weapons um, there was a ETC Werner's book uh, from way back, which is uh, somewhat racist and very dated. There's Yang Jing Ming's work um, from, um, uh, he did a, 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 a book on Chinese weapons. That's a fine reference. It probably is the best available in English now. Um, there's some works that have come out in Chinese too. Um, those are a little harder to find um, and not as um, revealing, but nobody's really done a good study of it. And um, part of the reason of that is because nobody really done a good study of Chinese martial arts because it's such a big and vast uh, topic. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty uncharted. Um, and things with, with Chinese martial arts in general, the terminology is very confusing. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult field. Um, also, the, the folk orientation of Chinese martial arts is difficult, and I'll explain that a little bit more later. But um, getting back to the battlefield point, um, there are the four weapons that we always talk about in Chinese martial arts. The first being the grandfather, I've got the little altar weapons, the staff. Uh, the second, well, not as a second, but uh, the Dao, the single edged 
saver. That's also uh, called the marshal, the king of weapons, the spear, and the gentleman of weapons, the tian. Um, I'm going to go through all four of these uh, to start, just to get some overview of where, what some of the misconceptions are around them. Um, one point I'd like to make is that things in Chinese generally come in fives, you know, five elements, five animals. So why are there four weapons? Um, there is a theory that uh, it's kind of like the cardinal directions. You have four cardinal directions, but you have that centerpiece. And so you have four weapons, and then you have that centerpiece of unarmed combat. Eh, you know, just a little feng shui for you. So starting with the staff. Uh, the general staff uh, that we use uh, is the eyebrow hot staff, right? The Um This is what's most common for traditional martial artists. And the reason for that, uh, that, that actually maps on very clearly. I mean, every culture has staff. It's the most fundamental one thing there is. And um, the eyebrow height, it's kind of like Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, where the proportion from you know, your, your, your hands is the same as your eyebrow to the floor. And this allows you to get from one end of the staff to the other very easily. So if I just open my hands out, I'm at both ends of the staff. Um, that's very parallel to what you see in a lot of quarter staff um, practices all around the world. The other staff that's pretty that's prevalent is the um, the rat tail staff, something called the rat tail staff, and it's a little longer. If you're standing on the ground, uh, it's as long as your hand is extended. <laughs> I always extend that up. Um, it uh, is called a rat tail or nicknamed a rat tail often because it, uh, it's it tapers. It's thinner on one end, fatter on the other. Essentially, it's a spear pole without the spear head. Um, and a lot of people will use the term, and this probably won't speak too well for our audience here, um, uh, bow staff. And that actually comes from uh, the Okinawan staff, which is a parallel like the Chime Gun. The difference between the Okinawan staff is it's fat in the middle and it tapers on either end. So when we say a bow staff, we really mean something like that. Um, that gives you certain abilities when you're fighting from the center of it. But it means you can't really shoot it out as well because you've got this, this fat end. Um, generally, that's not something seen in Chinese martial arts. The, the bow just got carried over because uh, Chinese Kung Fu was preceded by Okinawan Karate. And um, people just got used to the term. Uh, I'm going to harp a lot on how a lot of the terms we use are incorrect. Interestingly enough, in Chinese martial arts, uh, we don't see that much baton. Um, there is baton like staffs, and by that I mean like a police nightstick, um, like what they, you might use in uh, the Filipino martial arts. Um, it's a very highly practical weapon, obviously, the cops use it. Um, but uh, and there are there are many practices that there are some practices that practice with a short baton, but it's fairly uncommon, uh, which is interesting. What's actually becoming uh, more popular lately is uh, is biangang, which is a little longer, so literally whip staff. So that's about like shoulder height or breast height down to the floor. So it's a little longer, like a two-handed sword almost. Um, I like to think that, um, I like to think that, that that is gaining popularity now because of a 2017 cover story I wrote on the topic, but, um, but yeah, I don't. I really don't know why. It's, it's a curious riddle in Chinese martial arts. Why a baton isn't more prevalent? Just, excuse me. Huh, that's a little better. Um, spears and pole arms. Now there are so many variations of spears and pole arms, and um, that, that's that's another universal, very basic weapon. Um, the the um, one of the things that we need to consider is the cultural impact of a lot of these weapons, and, and like I said, Chinese weapons have um, an incredible variation. Where you'll see uh, an incredible the, the most of that variation is in the heads of pole arms. Um, and I'm going to put this up. a lot of that descend, descends from temple weapons. So this is my weapons rack. I don't know how well I can see that. Um, weapons rack are pretty common things that are that are 
around uh, altars. And I put this usually sits around my ancestral altar. Um, you'll see, oh, my whole point there. You'll see that there's a lot of weird, unique heads. I mean, some of these ones, like, like I don't know what, you know what you call that. What do you call that? You know? Uh, these are largely symbolic weapons. Um, in the uh, in temples is where they hold a lot of valuable objects, the, the icons, the statues, often made of gold, often made, uh, festooned with jewels. So uh, if you think about the ancient temples, they were very often um, raided by bandits. So, and this is one of the theories of the whole, of how Shaolin monks, why they learn martial arts, is they have to protect those. Symbolically speaking, uh, you'll see it often in the statuary around temples. Um, you'll see it uh, on, it's very common to see an altar as a centerpiece and then weapons racks on either side. And these weapons will be uh, very symbolic. I mean, some of them are genuine common weapons. Like if you saw on this rack, you know, I've got, and this is just one of many, right? But there's spears and, and, and you know, th things that are common and there's unusual ones. The unusual ones are often symbolic. So the interesting thing about that, I mean, there are many people that study these weapons and practice with these weapons. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, there's no archeological evidence of these weapons being used as weapons. The only place where we find them is inside of temples. Uh, some of the heads, and people still practice with some of these. Uh, probably the most common one, the monk spade. You know, we have a contemporary monk spade, which has a shovel end. Um, and that's very interesting, because that's something that we've hit on fairly recently. It doesn't appear in um, the literature until much later. Phone's always going. Of course, somebody always calls you on what's going on, right? Um, I got a big house here. I should have saw my phone. Excuse me. Um, the other big connection in Chinese martial arts weapons is opera. Now, opera is something we've talked about. Um, it has an incredible influence on. Um, modern day practice, as well as uh, uh, martial arts movies. Uh, Bruce Lee's dad, Li Hui Chun, was an opera guy. Uh, and then we're talking about traditional Chinese opera. Uh, Jackie Chan, Sam Hung, Yang Biao, Yang Mo Ping, all those guys were students of uh, Yu Jingyun, who was a, a opera uh, style. And I will argue that one of the reasons why there are so many martial arts movies, so many, excuse me, so many Kung Fu movies, um, is because of this root in opera that for generations, people have been studying how to perform fight scenes. If you've ever seen traditional Chinese opera, there's beautifully choreographed fight scenes. Um, and it's, um, it, it's, it's glorious to see because it's done live. Uh, those stunts feed into what happens in the movies. And which is why we, you know, we can't even begin to count how many Kung Fu movies are. there are. How many karate movies are there? Could you name a hundred of them? You know, how many Taekwondo movies? Could you name a hundred of them? How many MMA is short sheeted because it's only been around for a couple of decades, but how many of those? Could you name two dozen of them? How many Kung Fu movies? You can't even begin to name. I mean, you uh, thousands? Probably. It's a huge genre. And I think a lot of that reflects on, on how opera is done. You know, um, it's one of those things that, that it changes our posture because for generations, we have done Kung Fu and Wushu. Um, I mean, Wushu is new, but, but for generations, we've done it for uh, performance as well as for fighting. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in fact, it's glorious because we have these great movies. But if you think of like, I don't know if I can share this very well, but um, if you think about like that posture where, you know, my chest is out, you know, and I'm, I'm looking really bold, you know, that's not really a fighting pose. That's an opera pose because it's dramatic. You know, if my chest is out like that, you know, my, my diaphragm is exposed. You know, if I'm going to fight, I want to try and turn shrimp. But that's a whole different thing. We're not talking about um, empty hand. Um, but within these, uh, within these plays, uh, just like the Avengers, you would identify the characters uh, of these stories by their costuming and their weapons. So the weapons became very cartoonish. 
Um, there's a whole field of collecting opera weapons, which is its own unique discipline. Um, think of like Thor's hammer, right? So every um, hero and uh, say Outlaws of the Marsh, which has 108 heroes, each one of them um, had a unique weapon. And that was one of the ways you could identify them, like Lee Clay's axes, or, you know, most commonly, and we'll talk about this more later, you know, uh, Guan Gong's, that's Guan Gong right there, Guan Gong's uh, Guan Dao. Uh, the, the weapons became signature. Again, a lot of these weapons don't have any archaeological basis. Um, we don't see them. Uh, people are practicing forms with them. People are passing them down like something they've learned for, you know, generations, and maybe that's so. Um, but um, were they ever used on the battlefield? We don't know. We can't really prove it. We don't see battlefield examples of it. At the same time, we see such variation uh, within Chinese martial arts um, that it's not impossible. There's no way to kind of prove it either way. But the preponderance of evidence tends to first to believe that some of these weapons may be entirely uh, fantasy, may have been constructed. And then again, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just good to know that these weapons um, weren't used for combat because it changes your approach to practice and certainly for pounding that you're learning sort of for self-defense. Not only is that kind of absurd in the air of the gun, but um, it, it, it can change your interpretation. You know, you really need to get what, what your intention is and what you got out of it. So now, that was pole arms and that was staff. Let's get to, so we get to the more critical stuff. The Dao. All right. So this is our contemporary uh, modern Wushu Dao, right? No modern Wushu, we don't really have a tip anymore. Note that it's really, really light. At least springy. Uh, note the design of the blade, the cup, often referred to as the blood cup. Uh, this is one of those those myths that. Um, well, let me get into that for just a second. Let me talk about Dao for just a second first. Um, the Dao is frequently uh, referred to as the broadsword, and this, as a apologist, it drives me nuts because a broadsword is a very specific term in um, the, uh, in hopology. A broadsword refers to a knightly sword or an arming sword. Uh, think like uh, King Arthur's sword or Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's a wide, thick sword or thicker sword, bigger sword. It was called a broadsword to distinguish itself from thinner blades that were arising uh, more towards the, the Renaissance period. Uh, those being like uh, rapiers or small swords. Think the rapier, think like uh, Princess Bride or Three Musketeers or Zorro. Um, as the metallurgy gets better, um, the blades get smaller, they get thinner because the metal gets stronger and can sustain it. Now there's this sort of, uh, there's this romance of really big weapons and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but um, uh, these really big weapons, it's not practical, right? It's like it's like driving an Edsel. It's 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 it, it's heavier. It uses more gas. You want something more efficient in combat. You want something fast. You want something sharp. Uh, I mean, that weight doesn't really help you in combat. Which um, brings me to this whole flare in the sword. And I'm going to show you another example to get a better view. So here's another dial, right? Um, you can see how flared that is. You know, it's a, it's a pretty wide, pretty pronounced uh, part of the blade. Now, um, this style of sword definitely existed, but it wasn't uh, the most prevalent. Um, it's something that we've arrived on recently, um, and I can't really determine when, or maybe I should rephrase that because it does exist. Um, it's something that, that, um, uh, that we've all kind of arrived on and agreed upon as uh, a martial arts culture that this is what we're gonna practice with. Um, but it's not quite true to what was more common. So this is an actual antique doll. Um, notice that uh, it's even. It's more like a, a, a saber. 
Um, notice also that the guard is more like a disc, a Japanese suba, uh, if you will. Um, it's not. It's not of that same design. And think about it. Now, this kind of sword, um, if I have to manipulate it, I can turn it pretty quickly because it's, it's got a better balance. It moves quicker. Uh, that big Y blade isn't as aerodynamic. It's a little unwieldy. Great for training. Great uh, for wrist work. But in the practicality of combat, those thinner blades are more prevalent, more even blade. Um, like I said, these do really exist. Um, why did we arrive at that particular shape? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I propose that uh, it happened sometime during the um, during the modernization of weapons, where we are starting to mass produce um, mass produce weapons for training. Now that's a fairly new thing, really. It's only been around probably since post World War II, post founding of the People's Republic of China. Prior to that, sword makers made real swords. Um, in fact, at the school that I was training at um, uh, initially, my first kung fu school, uh, we had a real sword on the wall. It was a beautiful old piece. Um, it had a, a steel guard, a steel pommel. Um, it had a, a blade that was brown from oxidation, but it was a genuine sword, and uh, I used to love it. I used to work with it, you know, growing up. And then at a certain point, after I'd done enough blade research, I realized that that's not a mass-produced kung fu practice sword. That was a real sword, and I begged and pleaded with my master to take it off the floor because we were just beating it up, you know, regular practice. You really don't want to practice with an antique the way to ruin it. Um, and he eventually did. But uh, up until this mass production, you know, people made real swords. The notion of, of practice metal swords was, uh, at least in a mass produced uh, factory sort of way, is was fairly new, uh, just like sparring gear. I mean, we've always had sparring gear and we've always had swords that we practice with, but the mass production changes it, the industrial production. And for some reason, they agreed upon this particular shape of weapon. Now, uh, let's see. So the blood cup, um, it's really a guard. Uh, I don't know who made up the idea of the blood cup. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, I mean, a, a very sanguineous idea. I, I love the, 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 the romance of something like, you know, that blood. but I mean, think about it. If you stab something and um, the blood comes out, is it all gonna, I'm gonna like pour a thing, I'm gonna, is it all gonna get caught in this cup? No, that doesn't make any sense at all. <clears throat> I think it's more of a reflection of um, the gen, the design of the gen, and we'll get that to that next. Um, the other thing that I really wanna discuss is, uh, akin to the blood cup is the, uh, the blood gutters. So getting back to our original sword here. So you see this, this indentation. All right, this one, this one is a particularly wide one, uh, but sometimes you'll find thinner ones. Uh, here's a blade with thinner ones. Blood gutters, as they say. You can see those two. Um, so the theory, or what they say about the blood gutter is that um, when you stab somebody, there's so much pressure or suction that the blood, the blade gets stuck in it. Um, that doesn't make any sense at all, really. I mean, there is a possibility of a blade getting caught in the ribs. And in Western fencing, ancient Western fencing, they talk about uh, pronation, supination of the hand. Because if I pronate, hey, look at that small blade. So if I supinate or pronate, my blade is in, the, in line with the um, rib cage. If I go this way, then I catch in the ribs. And it's possible somebody was stabbed, they could collapse in on it and pin the sword. It's also possible that you could hit the lung and there could be a sucking wound. Very unlikely that a blood gutter would relieve that pressure. Really what a blood gutter is or what we call a fuller. And a fuller is just there to lighten the weight of the sword. Keep in mind, a heavy sword, if you have to fight for a long time, 
you don't want it to be too heavy. Um, you want it lighter. So it's like an I-beam, right? It, it, it's still strong, but it's not, um, not you've re removed some metal, so it's a little lighter. Uh, and uh, there are all sorts of intricacies to getting into that. Um, now I'm going to take a little diversion into, man, I'm getting a little bit behind time with all this, but, uh, a little diversion into the non-dial. Um, because I think it's the most interesting, and again, I'm not picking on you with you guys at all, but, so, here's a modern non-dial. I, I got to give props to Tired Claw, they lend me all the, uh, the Wushu weapons, because I don't really, I don't, I'm not a Wushu guy, obviously. Um, the non-dial is completely made up. It, it's the, the, nothing like the Nando ever really existed. There are similar things, but uh, I actually did a cover story with Wang Pei Kun, where he totally uh, talks about, um, this, this is in uh, 2013, uh, how the Nando was created because Wushu needed a, a weapon that uh, that was a sword for, you know, they had Nan Gun, uh, so there's Dap and Nan Chuan. Uh, now there are similar, like the, the probably thing that's most common is the Da Dao, right? And so that's similar. Now the, this is my personal Da Dao, and I used to use it for Shini form, which had this weird spin that I had to cut off the other part of the S guard. Oops, I know, kind of a small space. So you see this S guard. This used to have that too, but I cut it off because it was in my way. Now note the difference. This has the flare. It's got a much longer handle. Um, it also has a ring pommel. So it is parallel, and people will make the argument that this is similar to the Nandao, um, or that this was the Nandao. Uh, ironically, we see more use of Dadao, uh, that sort of sword, uh, in the north. The big difference, again, or the big difference here is that the blade is straight, completely straight up, right? So it's more like the blade of a um, butterfly sword. Right, which would be the southern weapon. And that was one of the initial ones that were proposed, but it's a double generally, uh, uh, played like a Schwan, uh, a Schwan weapon. So it, it didn't quite fit in what uh, Modern Wish was trying to do. The Jen. Now the Jen design, where's my modern Jen? <sighs> so Modern Wish with Jen. Um, I actually like the design of this now. Um, I mean, it's a little whippy for me, but um, uh, it, it uses a, a hollow ground, flattened diamond. I don't know if you can see that very well, um, which is a very authentic design. The guard um, is reasonable. You know, it, it, the design of the Jan hasn't changed that much. Um, sometimes the Jan is called the straight sword or the Tai Chi sword, another which I really care for because obviously we use it in Kung Fu, we use it in Wushu. Um, straight sword isn't very descriptive, but it actually comes from an old term, uh, derping, which means straight weapon. Um, I really wish that we could just revert, not use Dao and, and, and I'm sorry, use Dao and Jin, but not use broadsword and straight sword. Um, because, you know, it's just like how samurai swords reclaim their name as the katana. Most people know that they're katanas. Uh, Chinese martial arts deserves the same respect. And um, I hope that at some point, I mean, I used to write ad copy for Martial Arts Mart, and um, it pained me to call it a broadsword or trade sword or anyway. Um, the gin is not seen that much in design. So this is a replica of. I need to get my drop for this one. Oh, the sort of uh, Guo Jian. I'm sorry. Yeah, sort of Guo Jian. Um, Guo Jian, the sort of Guo Jian was from the spring and autumn period. Um, it was believed to be in existence in from 510 to 334 uh, uh, BCE. Um, it was an amazing discovery discovered back in, I want to say the 80s. I should have made a note of that. No, I'm sorry, the 60s. I didn't make a note of it. Um, uh, and it was in perfect condition, uh, still sharp. Um, but you can see the, the basic, it's a very simple sword. 
you know, the, this sort of guards what we typically, or sort of handles what we typically see, but that would have been wire wrapped. Uh, this was a bronze sword, actually tin and copper. Um, now you may think, well, that's a pretty short sword. And what were all the old ancient Chinese hobbits or what? Um, well, again, that comes to the metal. You know, when you're working with bronze, uh, bronze is not as strong as steel. Uh, and so you can't sustain a sword of, of as much length. It gets too heavy. Um, bronze can be polished to the point of being, you know, mirror shiny and can be as sharp as a razor, but it's softer metal. So it, when you cut something with it, you need to sharpen it again right, right away. The modern gin. And here's an antique. Actually, this is a strong gen. So two, sword in case. And you can see that the that, that the uh, the guard is uh, is very similar. You know, the same sort of cup guard. One of the things that um, that I think really affected the garb and, and a, a classic lobed pommel is it allows you to grip it in a certain way. You know, a lobed pommel allows you to hold it and give you that tech part. And this also gives you purchases in your hand. I think we were used to that rapier cup to protect the hand and think of this, you know, differently, like the cup is going the wrong way. Um, but actually it's a, uh, it's a different, it's a whole different take on the sword. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, Changed dramatically, and the modern interpretation of the gin is pretty spot on. Um, gin antique weapons like this, it's kind of hard to tell from the video I'm showing here, um, but this is fairly short. I mean, here you can see the length of my arm and the hand of it. No, it doesn't really show up well, but this is fairly short. Um, it's, a, it's a little over two feet. Um, and again, that's a with antique swords, you know, it's interesting. With antique gin, it's easier to find shuang gin than it is single gin. And I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe because they're just more rare and coveted. Um, they do tend to be shorter than what we're used to. Some of that is due to the metallurgy. Um, other parts of it is due to um, uh, probably because breakage. Um, who knows? Now, this leads us to a discussion of steel. Um, there are many different kinds of steel in the marketing of Chinese swords. The most common um, term you might hear is spring steel. Spring steel, and mind you, I'm, I'm gonna uh, oversimplify this discussion of, of metallurgy. Uh, if you really wanna know, you know, look up my castmates from uh, uh, Man at Arms, uh, Art of War, uh, Baltimore Knife and Sword. That works. They wonderful. They, these guys are forgers, and they really know their stuff when it comes to metallurgy. I'm just going to simplify it just to, to kind of get it from a marketing angle on how on the kind of products that we use in terms of uh, swords. Um, so spring steel just means that it's springy. So and it's a it's a wide variety of spring steel. So this is spring steel. You know, I can bend it and it's going to return to shape. Um, and it comes with many different kinds of steel. Now, uh, sword steel is a little different than um, uh, knife steel, and that's a major uh, factor to hold in your head for a little while. Um, the other common steel that we talk about is stainless steel. I love this going to be a mess. Stainless steel. So. You know, I've been gloving up for some of these. Um, this one I do, really don't need to, it's, it's stainless. Stainless means that it's, um, it's got, I think, 10% chromium uh, in, in the mix. Um, steel is a combination of carbon and iron and then other alloys. Um, stainless, by, by nature of adding that chromium, it resists oxidation. So I could hold on to this and it's not gonna print up. The oils in my hand are not gonna stain it. Um, it also holds a really good edge. So it's very good for knife steels. We'll talk about stainless steels and kitchen knives quite a bit. Um, uh, also with working knives. Uh, a very common thing we used to hear in um, marketing of stainless steel, or in marketing of swords, particularly with katanas, was uh, 440C surgical steel. 
And um, that's what's used to make scalpels. So it's sharp, it holds an edge and it doesn't oxidize. It's also, um, can be brittle if not, it can be brittle for actual sword play, but you know, it was a marketing thing for some reason people latched on. Um, Another major marketing thing we talk about a lot is combat steel. Combat steel is something we just made up, Um, (laughs) not me, but uh, it's, it's a term we use to refer to steel that's not you know, at that, when that started, started to emerge, it was when wushu weapons started to emerge. And so we also talk about wushu steel, wushu steel being much lighter and flippier, um, combat steel being much more sturdy, more like real um, sword steel. Um, then there's carbon steel. Um, now, that piece, this one is carbon steel, which is why I wear the glove. So carbon steel, this is that antique again. Um, Carbon steel uh, allows you to, well, actually all all steel has carbon in it, but it doesn't have any chromium. So these will rust, which is why I'm wearing the glove. The hands and the oil in your hands will cause oxidation. Um, It holds a much sharper edge. Um, And most of the weapons that we see the antiques were high carbon steel. These need to be maintained. I mean, I can show you one that's really rusty. I was going to, but I don't know, I'm gonna do that right now. Um, these, uh, this is what's more common for, for real, real swords, real weapons. Um, then there's what we often call Damascus steel. Now, uh, Damascus steel is made from a crucible kind of steel uh, that was uh, developed in the sixth century in India called wood steel. And it's what we commonly, we call it Damascus, not because it was from Damascus, but because it, uh, Damascus was a major part of trade. So this isn't gonna show that well, but you can look at this and see how there's a grain pattern to it. This is a modern one. I have some antiques that have grain powder to the, to, the, to the steel. Can you see that? Maybe I can come back a little bit more. Can see it. Yeah. Um, that grain wood pattern, like wood or water, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's what's called pattern welding often. In, um, or let me rephrase that. It can be used in pattern welding. People can actually force designs and patterns into it. Uh, um, the idea is that a sword blade needs to be both strong and uh, flexible. Uh, so, and it has to be hard and flexible. So the edge needs the hardness and the core needs some flexibility. And this is an oversimplification again, but um, you wanna have both qualities within your steel. And by making patterns welded steel or by making Damascus steel, you can drive the hardness to the edge and uh, maintain the flexibility. That's kind of what uh, the whole point of you know, the folding the billet in Japanese swords, that laminating, layering uh, method of making uh, 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 sword blades. The other way which you could be twisting wire, that's close, closer to patterns, but the or pattern welding. But uh, there's all sorts of ways and it's, it's kind of highly guarded in terms of, um, I mean, you gotta keep in mind, this was weapon technology. So to make this, here's another example of a Damascus steel. Maybe this one will show better. See in the, oh, the blog gutter, in the fuller, that pattern a little bit. Doesn't show very well, unfortunately. One of the hardest things that you used to have to do was to, to uh, photograph Damascus steel. It takes quite a, or kind of old steel. It's all reflected. So back to uh, the Guandao uh, and exaggerated weapons. We have a whole body of weapons that are super heavy. And here I've been saying that in combat, you wanted these weapons that were uh, light. Uh, well, the, the, the heavy weapons, like the heavy Guandao, that was used in uh, military tests um, as a test of strength. And it's great for training. So a lot of these really absurdly heavy weapons um, uh, have a much have much more functionality, so that even that wide um, uh, that wide 
Dow blade in our, in our modern practice, because we're just doing this for health, we're not actually gonna go sword fight. I mean, honestly, how many of you have been in a sword fight? Um, this is gonna build more strength. You know, this is gonna build more flexibility, more versatility. If I can handle this, I can handle one of the, the thinner ones. Um, it, it, it takes a, a, a training quality. Um, you'll see that also in super long uh, poles, pole arms. Um, I mean, there's an argument that could be made for a long pole like you see in uh, well, like Wing Chun or some of the long pole practice when you see like 13 foot spears. Um, and these do have existing, they do exist. Um, it's just a sort of a battlefield weapon. It's something you would carry around. It's hard to carry around a 13 foot pole everywhere you go. Um, uh, Chi Chi Guang had these crazy sleeve catcher weapons, which were these long poles with like this, this, this nest of hooks and such. Um, that would, they would just thrust into enemy lines. And, uh, that, um, those definitely existed. Um, I'm surprised nobody has a form with them, or at least I haven't seen one. Um, the, the battlefield weapons, um, and the weapons that were made extra heavy for training, uh, that, that, uh, that there, there's a tradition of that. It's viable. In a way, it's authentic. Um, I wanted to talk a lot about variation, or not talk a lot about variation, but I wanted to kind of end with this piece, one of my favorite pieces and the one I have in the pose. Um, it is, it is kind of rusty, but here's a dowel. All right, it's Etienne, all right? And then here's where it gets interesting. It's a Dao and Jin that all combine into a single sheath. What's the use of this? I don't know, I think it's just for the maker skills. Um, I mean, I suppose there's that movie sense that oh, I could lose my Jin and then I'd have my backup Dao. But, um, I bring it out mainly to, to, to point out that while I'm making all these points, there's so much variation in Chinese martial arts um, that, you know, we're clan blade based. So things are um, muddy in that sense. One of the reasons why we, it's hard to really study apology is that um, there's so much variation and really um, for everything you can kind of establish as the truth, you'll find outliers. Um, Oh, I should talk about one more thing that I kind of went over and missed at the time. Yeah, I do. And that is the seven stars. So you can see it. There's my glove. You can see it in this one. You see those brass insets? This is sharp. So there's one right here, one right there. There's seven of them. And they're actually cored all the way through. So um, they're on both sides. And the seven, that, that was the mark of, of Long Trin, the Dragon Well. Uh, the Dragon Well was established, um, oh, many, many years ago. That's my next note. Um, back in the spring and autumn, I think, right? It was uh, primarily attributed to Oyeza, who was a, a mythical or a legendary sword maker. And according to legend, he found this place. Um, uh, so yeah, spring and autumn, uh, 770 to 476 BCE. Um, he found these seven wells um, that were in the shape of the Big Dipper, so very auspicious. Um, only one well survives now. And the community is high on the mountain the community is dedicated to making weapons. And while they're making many really nice high-end stuff, um, that's sort of, the, their, their working thing is they make wushu weapons. That's the most common because that's where they make the most money. Um, frankly, um, you've got to kind of, um, you know, like, like a lot of the great uh, katana makers um, make more of their real cash out of uh, selling high-end kitchen knives really high end but um the point being that you don't have a lot of collectors out there who are willing to pay as much for a really nice sword i mean as much as you would pay for a really nice car uh, for a sword that's just a very limited market so you have to do other things that are more uh practical to make ends meet 
and so for Long Chuan, it's um, it's these it's wushu weapons now. Um, uh, I want to end with one comment that you know if I said anything here that that you're like oh my god I you know I don't want to do this anymore my my swords are all fake. Um, don't be discouraged. You know do what you love, but be honest about it. Uh, right now, the greatest uh, growing martial arts group in the world is lightsaber practice. I mean, there's so many people doing lightsaber now. There's Ludo Sports, so they're all across Europe. Uh, France made lightsaber like a, a formal f- sport. Um, and clearly, well, that's made up. I mean, or, or the galaxy far, far away. It, it, and so there's nothing wrong about that. They don't worry about their authenticity or their validity as a martial art. Um, they, it, practice what you love. Um, but no the roots of it and don't propound uh, ideas that have been refuted uh, in the general pop, uh, in the general literature. Um, there are all the people that are really starting to dig into this now, not just me, but a lot more uh, dedicated scholars than I. And they're coming up with a lot of very interesting things in terms of um, that refute some of our weapons. Uh, don't get all freaked out. Uh, just, you know, better to know. Um, with that, I think I'm at the point where we'll open for questions, if there are any. Hi, Gene. Um, so we have a question from Curtis. Uh, he's asking, could you comment on the horsehair attached to the end of spears and tiger forks and what if any know, practical actually. usage um, they may have? So, yeah. Um, so swords often have uh, swords have tassels, right? Um, I don't have a spear with me that has, what do I do? My little altar thing here. Actually, all my little altar weapons have these little tassels, right? Right, the little red tassels. Um, so the, 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 the leading thought of that was that it soaks up the blood when you stab somebody, kind of like the blood cup. Um, and I think there is probably something to that. Um, the tassel on a sword is obviously on the wrong end, so that's not a good theory. I've heard people try to sort of propound this where they would, that was where your cloth to wipe the blood off your sword. I don't know if people get so fixated about the blood of it. Um, I think that's very unlikely. I think the sword tassels were actually um, lanyards because there's a lot of sword um, in other cultures that have sword tassels. You know, uh, that's fairly common. Um, the um, more likely, or okay, this is my take on it, is I think that this more descended from the symbolicness, both of the temple weapons I discussed before, and predominantly from opera, right? Because an opera, you need to show it's got to it's look like blood. But I don't really know. I can't really validate that in either which way. Those are just my uh, theories on it. Another question? Um, so another question uh, from Scott Jeffrey. Uh, he's asking, what is your favorite weapon to find from your travels? God, you know, I, I worked uh, as a, a, a at this shop making swords and I, I the, for summers I would be drawing uh, the catalog because it's old school, you know, line drew hundreds of swords. And I, I did that up in the weapons room where all of our premium weapons were, we called it the cage because we're in a locked room. And, um, you know, it was it was down on Folsom Street in San Francisco, which was, um, I mean, sometimes we'd have crazy people come in and grab a sword off the wall and swing it around. We'd all have to run out from the shop with our hammers and stuff. And so, you know, doing those weapons, I always thought, you know, which one would I grab off the wall? Um, and there was this little janky like suit of armor that was about a yard high. That wasn't even a weapon. And I always thought I'd hit him with that because it'd be so absurd. Um, but more on point to Scott's question, um, uh, my personal favorite uh, falls in between the tiger hooks, which I'll address much more in my next uh, installment, and um, and the three sectional staff, just because I think both are 
so quintessentially Chinese in their nature. You don't see a parallel that in other cultures. I'm also very fond of, of heavy guan daos, like the super heavy ones, just because that's just, you know, when you see somebody wielding a hundred pound guan dao, that's just badass. Another question? Um, so plenty more questions actually. Um, no, the next one is uh, anything to say about the purported 18 legendary weapons of China? Ah, right. So this weapons rack that I showed you um, has 18 weapons. Uh, well, at least there's, there's these two extra ones and then there's the Dao and Dian. Um, I've always believed that the 18 weapons, that the number, I mean, there's two dominant theories. One is that 18 is nine plus nine and nine is the emperor's number, the highest single digit. If you go to the um, Forbidden City, everything's arranged in nines, like nine stairs, nine windows, that sort of thing, because it honors the emperor. And so it's some sort of, sort of sacred number. My personal take on it goes back to the temple um, uh, of what, in Buddhist temples where we have the, the 18 Lohan or the 18 Arhat, which are guardians, and well, as a simplified of what they are, but guardians of the temple. Um, and uh, they, they are, they are, they had the potential to become the Buddha, but they're kind of self-centered in a way, or they, they don't, they were reclusive. So they don't really have the compassion. Uh, it's not really, I'm not really phrasing this quite well because I've talked for half an hour or an hour on this. Um, but there are 18 in Chinese Buddhism. In Indian Buddhism, there are 16. And um, so I think that the, that 18 became a symbolic, symbolic number. It was very pervasive through Chinese martial arts. Um, from that Buddhist root, that connection. That's something I've, I, I can't really prove that because um, I can't figure out where exactly it, um, that number originated, you know, who wrote it down first. But uh, that's just my gut feeling on it. I'm looking at the body of the research. Next. Uh, next question. Um... Hi, Gene from Michelle. Uh, do you have more information on double short rods slash double batons? Ah, uh, you know, it's only fair piece on that. So I think my little double short rods on my altar. Um, the hard whip. Um, I mean, basically, it's a neural whip, and uh, it's primarily seen in, in the Taoist uh, temples. Um, I have a photo of just this magnificent one I saw in Wudong that was like solid iron and maybe a yard high and it must have weighed, I don't know, hundreds of pounds. It was a rock. You couldn't pick it up, but uh, crazy. Um, basically, it's a knurled baton and I was actually going to go off into that when I was talking about the lack of batons in Chinese martial arts. Um, it's a very... Um, it's, it's something that's prevalent in Chinese, in China, um, but it's not seen, it didn't really come over here so much. I mean, they think it, it enjoyed a little bit of uh, popularity in the West after Crushing Tiger and Dragon because Michelle picks one up and fights uh, Zhang Ziyi with it. Um, I, I don't know a lot about its symbology. Um, I've heard theories where they say that the, the different, um, these different, bumps, you know, uh, textured for your pleasure or actually textured to hurt you more because it's like jags on a knife. You know, if I hit you with a pole, but I hit you with this, I can actually cause you much more of an abrasive hit. Um, and there are some people that talk about patterns in it, that, that, that there's some sort of mystical patterns in the way that some of the times these are very complex. Um, that's about all I really know about it offhand. Next. Next question. Um, can you speak about the Taoist horsetail whisk? Horsetail whisk. Uh, horsetail whisks, uh, fly whisks, right? They're, they're basically um, like a pole with um, horsetail on it. Um, you see whisks uh, all through Africa. Um, it's a very common thing there. Um, it's very common also for Taoist, for a gentleman person to carry one of these. Um, I used to have one. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it got taken from me. But um, it wasn't antique though, so it was no big. Um, they're very useful in uh, brushing away flies <laughs> because I mean, horses dull them on their butts to brush away flies. Uh, it, 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 it works because as opposed to like a fly spotter, you ever look at a fly spotter and know it's like, like mesh? Because if you had it flat, the fly would be able to feel that, that paddle. Well, the horsetail would, and I've used this you know, at music festivals to push off flies. Um, 
uh, they don't feel it coming because it's like strands of hair. Um, the big, my big comment on horsetail whips is that every horsetail whip, um, and I actually called a horsetail whip master out on this, uh, believes that you can use it to disarm people, that you could flip the whip around like a weapon and it would like, you know, do that Indiana Jones whip thing, and grab the whip and pull it out. Physically impossible. You know, and I, I try it, try it. Give somebody a stick, hit them as much as you want on the hand, see if you can take that weapon away. It's one of those sort of mythologies that, uh, well, exactly what I kind of want to do with this talk. I don't want people to get called out on it like I called out that master and um, and discover, wow, I've been propounding this thing that's totally, I never tried it. It, it doesn't work. You know, it's just something my sheriff taught me and I never really tried it. Um, I'll get, again, I'll get more into that. The, the next talk I want to, uh, the next talk scheduled for me is about applications of weapons and I'll talk much, talk to that much more in length. Stay tuned. Awesome. Um, so, or? Uh, I think we're about to wrap up. I'll, I'll finish with one last question um, okay. from uh, uh, Huascar. Um, is there any sword from Wudong Temple still in perfect shape in these times that could still cut clean through other swords? <laughs> um, sure. I imagine there is. I mean, any sword can cut through another sword. It depends on what the other sword is. I mean, I could cut through that Wushu sword with one of my antiques sword. I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't want to test that. Um, uh, it's, it's more a metal, matter of what the sword is made of. You know, that, that, that's actually not, it's not hard to cut through another, actually I should rephrase that. If the other sword is, if one sword is weaker and one sword is stronger, it's not hard to cut through, right? Um, I, I had this fantasy once because we, used, we, we did this tournament, Tire Claw Elite Championships. I had this fantasy of having like a sword test you know, because there's a big issue about, you know, people bringing wushu swords to compete in traditional, which I do not endorse. You know, wushu swords just stay in wushu. That's where it belongs. Traditional sword, you want to use something as real like what I'm discussing, at least heavy. Um, but to have a sword test where they had to, like, slice something first. Or, uh, and you have to keep in mind, we don't work sharp, which is a major um, gap and something I'll address again in my, my next seminar. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, you know, I've, I've not actually seen in person an antique uh, Wudong sword to my knowledge. Um, I've seen a lot of modern Wudong swords that are just gorgeous, beautiful. Um, they're doing some really fine work in, in making swords now. Um, but I haven't seen an antique that, that we could really get the prominence and say that this is a Wudong sword. But in terms of one sword cutting another, that, that can happen. It really depends on the individual sword. It's very easy to do, actually, if the, the one sword is much more, uh, it's just better tempered, better made than the other sword. Thanks. Um, actually, I'm going to sneak in one last question here, um, okay. because I, I've also seen this um, on my own social media feed recently. Um, but some, um, we have a question asking about, is there any, do you have any commentary on rope dart? On rope dart? Yeah, because um, I've seen it on my social media that someone was saying, hey, unpopular opinion, rope dart, not a real weapon. <laughs> um, no, it is a real weapon. It's definitely a real weapon. We see it in the literature. Uh, um, it, uh, I mean, the fancy like slit knot things that we do in Wushu, that may not be quite so real. Um, but um, the idea of putting you know, a ball on a string or a, a weight on a string and funneling it at somebody, uh, that's... Uh, that's sort of a no-brainer. You know, it makes sense um, to do to get. Um, and you'll actually see. Uh, this is one of the things that um, the precursor to rope dart. I mean, rope dart really comes in popularity with modern wushu because uh, all the slip knots, which are just fabulous and, and brilliant and uh, a wonderful interpretation of the weapon. Um, but prior to that, uh, you do see traditional examples of meteor hammer, which is a big fat ball, kind of like a, like what? Well, ouch. These things are sharp, by the way, and I just put my finger on it, um, like this kind of thing, uh, but on a rope, all right? Um, it's not as pointed as a dart, but, you know, I, I know several rope dart players, uh, some of my Kung Fu brothers who are just crazy for rope dart, and they can throw that thing into a tree. It's not that hard. Um, it was just with some practice. Um, there are competitions, um, special weapons competitions being done in China where in addition to having to do your form, they set up targets on either side of the ring and the rope darter has to hit 
each target a certain amount of times. I don't really know the rules, but I've seen demonstrations of that. Um, so yeah, totally, it's totally a real weapon. Uh, the modern interpretation, like a lot of our modern interpretations performs, is a little bit more flamboyant and more opera, more artsy. But um, uh, th there is uh, definitely evidence of uh, rope dart prior to um, modern show. We good? Great. Thank you very much, Gene. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, we have uh, quite a few number uh, more questions um, that could be answered. Um, but Gene will be back on July 11th uh, with his follow-up um, seminar on, I believe, application. Okay. Yeah, application. Thank you all so much for having me. Great. Thank you, Gene.